We are very excited about episode 59 as we welcome Mark with Cracking Golf. Mark is an entrepreneur who creates custom and limited edition putters, ball markers, and divot tools. He has over 36,000 followers on Instagram and his handle is at Cracking Golf. Mark, th- thank you so much for taking the time and hopping on the podcast. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I want to kind of get started and just the logo is very cool, but how long has Kraken Golf been in business and where did you get the name and the idea from? Yeah, so 2017, November 2017. Uh, so that was that five years now. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a uh, it's been a long road. <laughs> five years of a lot of hard work and and uh, uh, dedication and uh, a lot of help along the way from family and friends and and all of that. So it's been a cool ride. Um, the logo itself is just uh, well, a couple of things. First off, I, I live in Massachusetts, a uh, small town called Cushnet. Uh, all of us being golfers, we all know it's the headquarters of Titleist. Uh, so I think half the town works for Titleist for the most part. Um, I don't, never have, uh, but uh, I am a big time golf. Uh, yeah, so Cushnet is the next town over from New Bedford, which is a big whaling. Uh, it was whaling capital of the world, probably. Two three hundred years ago, so um, right on the ocean, uh, you know, fishing and, and all of that, and that's kind of where uh, you know Kraken kind of came from. But it's uh, it was before the hockey team in Seattle, uh, so I can I can claim it for that. But uh, uh, yeah, it's just you know by the ocean. It's uh, you know ocean's a big part of our life uh, in this area, uh, and I'm just kind of marrying that together with golf, and uh, that's kind of how it came together. Do you have, uh, like you talked about, it's five years, been, you know, a, a long time coming, but is that something that you've, you, uh, have you had um, coworkers? Is it just like a one man show? How, how do you do the social media, the custom builds and, and manage everything all at once? Uh, one man show. Um, I probably work too many hours. Uh, I probably operate too much machinery that's probably not too safe at the same time <laughs> to make it all happen. Um, but yeah, no, it's me. I do every, I do all the designs, I do all the milling, uh, all the finish work, shipping, uh, Instagram, direct messages. I, I spend way too much time on that. Probably my wife would agree. Um, so marketing, I mean, all of it. Uh, the only person that uh, is outside of here that has anything to do, uh, with the business is my accountant. Uh, I don't do accounting work, <laughs> but other than that, it's, uh, it's all me. Yeah. Um, how, how did you learn to like use the equipment and how many pieces of equipment do you, do you own? And, and I guess to piggyback off of that, does a divot tool, a ball marker and a putter require like multiple machines and are they different machines? Yeah. So I have a, I have a bunch of machines right now. It's a, it's a single car garage attached to the house. We're in the process of, uh, building a putter studio. It'll still be, uh, at my residence, but it'll be a, a detached four car garage with an upstairs studio and all of that. So I'm hoping to, to have that in place by spring. Um, but right now I have uh, two Haas mills, um, which are, uh, you know, production quality uh, CNC machines and um, a bunch of lasers. Uh, so I got a couple of mobile lasers, which are fiber lasers, which I use for a lot of the detailed engravings. Um, but one of the things I like to do is you can kind of see, I think in some of the work is I, I kind of like over-engineering things. So I try to make it as difficult as possible, uh, to make a product that's, you know, unique and, uh, you know, when you hold it and feel it, you're like, wow, this is a, a piece of something. It's substantial. Um, so that's like the most important thing to me. I want to add as much detail as I possibly can. Um, you know, with that comes with, you know, a limitation on quantity, right? Because there's so much detail. Um, there's a lot of finishing work that goes into it. Um, you know, I, I can't mass produce a thousand units. I, you know, it would take me six months to do something like that on a, on a intricate item. So I usually limit stuff to, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 up to my largest releases have been like a hundred units. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, the shop is, Jam packed. It's a one stall garage with two pretty large mills in it in the center, and it's surrounded by cabinets and lasers and 
all the other finishing equipment you need to to finish the stuff after it comes off the mill. So um, definitely probably doesn't meet OSHA rec- uh, recommendations. So, uh, so we'll keep that quiet. Like, yeah, we'll keep that off the record. <laughs> but uh, that's why it's really just me. There's, you know, it'd be great to have more folks working on it, but there's literally no room. Um, I'm tripping over stuff myself. Never mind, you know, worrying about, uh, you know, an apprentice or something like that getting hurt. So, uh, it's just me. What is your favorite like metal or material to work with? Like, do you like the stainless steel? Do you like the aluminum? Is it the copper? Um, probably, uh, probably stainless, maybe like brass or copper. Um, I, I like brass and copper because of the density and the weight to it. Um, uh, I mean, you get a nice, good size copper or brass coin. You can feel the weight of it, and it's substantial. And, uh, and I think it's important when you're playing golf to have something like that in your pocket. Is, you know, compared to like aluminum, which is so light that if it fell out of your pocket, you might not even notice. With this, you you would definitely notice. So um, the other thing that's nice about copper and brass is they're they're softer metals, so um, they're a little bit easier to work with. You can get a lot more intricate with it. Um, and the other thing that's great about it is because it's soft metal, it's faster to mill, faster to laser. Uh, so you can produce, you know, higher volume, uh, in less time. So, uh, and I like the look of it. I think they patina nice, especially copper where you can get some of those, uh, you know, greenish patinas or blue, you can kind of force those or darken them. Um, there's a lot of different finish uh, options with, uh, with those metals. Speaking of copper, I, we were just kind of going through some of the putter, the, the collection here that you had on your, web, you have on your website and I'm a big basketball fan. So I, I think the, uh, the copper basketball, uh, putter that you did was, was awesome. And you had the 23 on there too, which is, which is, yeah. which is the number, my number. Um, but, uh, it, it w- with COVID and all that happening, was there an issue with getting any of these metals and, or do you have a pretty good stock of, of copper and brass and all the different yeah. equipment? Are, are you hoarding just chunks of stainless steel? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I, do you have like pieces where you end up like, ah, this didn't turn out too good. So I'm going to chuck it, but maybe oh, we yeah. can come out there and we can take care of some of your, uh, <laughs> your oopsies. Your oopsies. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that. I mean, I don't, I don't post them too often. I always just try to post the good looking stuff, but I actually did an Instagram post, I think it was last week, where it was a reel where I just ran through a bunch of stuff that I screwed up. Uh, and it happens all the time. I mean, when you make pieces that are this intricate, um, you know, screw ups just happen. Like, if you don't screw up, then I kind of look at it as it probably wasn't challenging enough. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and I've had some major ones like, you know, pieces of Mokum, which is brass and copper forged together, kind of like Damascus steel. Uh, very expensive. I had a putter maybe two or three months back where I just, I don't know, I, maybe it was too early in the morning. And I didn't have my coffee yet or something. And I put it on the mill the wrong way and it came off so bad. So it's a very expensive paperweight now. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, it happens all the time. The other thing that's kind of cool that happens sometimes is, I mean, I'm rushing around milling stuff, shipping things. Uh, I'm like all over the place and, you know, things fall behind benches and stuff like that. And every once in a while I'll clean out the shop and I'll just find a piece from like two years ago that's half done. Um, and you know, people like that kind of stuff, you know, and so I'll just finish it up maybe a little bit different than whatever the release was to make it unique. Um, and those are kind of the, the the gems that you find hidden underneath the workbench that has been sitting there for like a year or two. Do you have like a favorite product that you've made or if, if you can list like three of your top three products that you've made, it could be a ball marker, divot tool or a putter. Anything come yeah. to mind? I mean, for me right now, I'm in love with the, uh, the, my born 4.0 putter. So it's my gamer right now. Um, I designed it, I think three months ago. Um, so I, I kept the first one. I think there's six more out there right now. Um, and I think it's a backlog of about 10 that I need to get to people waiting on, but, uh, that putter is like my favorite putter. Like, uh, I enjoy using it. I can't wait to play around a golf just to put it in my hands. So, uh, I'm really high on that right now. Um, uh, of recent releases in my bag right now, I have, uh, the rotor and caliper ball marker. So it's carbon steel rotor. I'm a big car guy. So, um, yeah, and it has like a red uh, caliper on it with the Kraken logo. So um, that's pretty cool. I have a new version of it coming out, hopefully, um, 
uh, before Christmas. Um, but, uh, that's one of my favorites right now, but it's, it's funny, but like the, the next release is my next favorite. Cause I feel like I keep pushing ideas and, uh, you know, we just did the lightning bolts, which you guys are going to get one. Um, that one's pretty cool. It's the first time I really explored wood with a divot tool. So, um, and, and the wood is really cool. It's a medium that I don't usually work with, but I like working with. It might be a lot more of that uh, moving forward. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and I guess the other thing I would mention is there's a, uh, all my putters are, are named after towns on Cape Cod. Uh, so Bourne is a, a, a town right over the bridge of the canal. Um, uh, the Yarmouth uh, is, is a town on Cape Cod. And then there's a new putter design that's half done that I, I think I milled it about a month ago. And, and I was done milling just half of it and literally had to take my son to parkour practice. And I'm a weirdo. I carried it in my pocket and I was kind of looking at it while we're at parkour. So it, it, it hasn't been touched since then. It's still half done sitting on my desk over here. Uh, but that one's going to be called the Hyannis Pour. I'm pretty high on that. I think it's going to be a great putter. I just need to find some time to finish it at some point. <laughs> See, you're lucky you're not from Minnesota. Otherwise, you'd be naming things like the Mata Midai putter, yeah. the, the, the Luth putter, or the Wyzetta putter that nobody can pronounce. Yeah, the Rose it's funny. But yeah, all these weird names that no one knows how to pronounce. That's like yeah. one of the big things with Minnesota in the Midwest. We're like, how do you pronounce that name? And we have Is it like Native American names or no. a lot of that well, here in Massachusetts? But... I, there are a few, but there that... are there are a few that are just spelled really dumb. Like YZ is a good example. Yeah. How do you think you would spell YZ? Uh, start with a Y. <laughs> no. W. No. Yeah, you. That's a thing. you. You would think. think it's W A Y Z A T A Wayzata, <laughs> but it's YZ. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have some, we have a lot of Native American names here that are sometimes um, tough to pronounce and spell. I mean, Massachusetts is Native American, but. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, Cape Cod, it doesn't seem to be that much. It's a lot of it's English, uh, like old Brit Britain type English. So, uh, and it's based off town. A lot of the towns are the same towns you'll find in England. So uh, it's oh, kind of wow. cool, kind of different. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of where I've taken it a little bit. A little cool one, now that I'm thinking about it, now that they're talking about Native American names, uh, the BD Makaska putter. That would be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. That's a lake in <laughs> Minneapolis. Yeah, that would oh, be pretty dope. Dope. Yeah. It sounds like sorry, are you yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so are you like I know you're backed up, but you said you had like 10 putters and all that, and I'm sure you're with all your limited releases, but do are you like your own salesperson? Do you ever just like get like paired up with some random golf and they're like, That's a sick putter? Like, where did you get that? And then you're you just sell them just like that, right, right off the course? Um I don't actually, uh, I mean, it's happened where, you know, I, I meet someone and they're like, what's that, what's that you're using there? And, and then, you know, we go down that road, but it's funny when I, when I play with folks, especially if I play with someone, like we just get paired up, like a buddy brings somebody, I, I honestly never talk about crack and I, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. Uh, and for me, when I play golf, I'm like really competitive. Um, so I'm super focused and the last thing on my mind, unfortunately probably is business um like save so it for after the round we'll talk about it a yeah bit. you know 19th <laughs> hole type thing or something yeah. but for me it happens where people will ask me and usually those are the rounds where it goes bad because once i start talking business like i don't focus anymore and it's sure a way that's how they make the money though right that's how they that's how they take maybe they win a ball marker off of you they get you yeah, a, you yeah. Know. It, it's crazy i mean uh, i mean everything is uh you know instagram based that's where i focus all my marketing efforts i just pick that as the platform um, and then, uh, as of late, I would say over the last nine months or so, um, I've been selling exclusively to my email list for the most part. So, um, I'll do some marketing there, but the goal of Instagram is to get people to join the email list. And if you want access to my stuff, you got, you got to be on that list. Otherwise, you know, the chance of getting it are, are pretty unlikely. I'm on that list. Even through that list, it's still unlikely. It's it's which is a good thing for no, you. Oh yeah, no, don't get me wrong. It's a great problem to have. And yeah. it's super cool to see it sell out immediately. But sometimes I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah, I mean it's it's cool and it's not because uh you know, right after that, you know, release ends, 
that's when all the the hate mail comes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Imagine to say, yeah. I'd imagine you get a lot of people that are excited about that drop, and then of course, if they don't get it, they're just they're just hate you. And I, that is the, there is pros and cons, of course, to that. Um, uh, I was going to ask you though, do you have you seen anyone specifically use your equipment like randomly on the golf course when you're playing that you that you didn't even know that you sold it? Uh -huh. I, it has happened. I mean, I, I don't do as much, honestly, like within Massachusetts as I probably should. It's not a, a focus of mine. I, I just kind of focus on Instagram. And uh, through that, I, you know, kind of have a lot of people down south and overseas and stuff like that. Maybe Massachusetts doesn't use Instagram. I don't know. But uh, I'll run into people every once in a while. Like, it was funny. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my son's a big soccer player. And we were at an event, uh, you know, maybe eight or nine towns away from my town. So we got he got invited to play in this uh, weekend tournament, and and I was there. And then uh, you know didn't meet anybody, nothing happened. He played, and we went home. And I got a message later in the week with from a a, a person that I didn't know, and he just happened to message me and say, "Hey, were you at a soccer event this weekend?" And I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, I, I thought it was you, but I didn't want to come up to you." I'm like. You should have, we would have talked, you know, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it doesn't really happen too much that I run. I mean, I, 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 am part of a private club. I don't sell to them. Uh, I don't even think they know I'm cracking golf. I just, again, I'm, I'm so focused on golf playing. Um, but, uh, you know, every once in a while you'll run into somebody that has something and it's kind of cool, you know, uh, you know, just to kind of have that little bit of recognition, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it doesn't happen too often. Uh, what what is the most requested item that that you get a lot of DMs from or for or emails? Um, the crayons have been really popular. Um, there's a like a subset of folks that collect my stuff that really just collect crayons. Um, so I'll get messages from them every so often. When's the next drop? And you know, my response usually is, "I'm kind of running out of colors, guys. So let's we want to do redo." <laughs> oh. Uh, I've done pretty much all of it. There are there are two new colors um, in the works right now that are different. Um, but beyond those two, um, the only thought I have is maybe I start going into precious metals or something like that. I don't know, but uh, we're kind of running a uh, running its course on that a little bit. But that's a really popular item. Uh, people have loved that. Um, what else do people ask me about a lot? The leather you know, item, like a crayon box for the crayons. I have. Okay. Uh, it's one of those things where uh, it's probably one of my screw ups. <laughs> so I designed the box, fits crayons fine. I just didn't like the look of it or the the feel of it. It wasn't as, you know, I always say the word substantial. I wanted it to be more substantial. So um, on my design board, I do have a, like I was just about to mention leather, um, a leather case that's going to mm -hmm. look like crayon boxes. Um, I haven't designed it yet. It's just a vision I have, but uh, that's an item that I hopefully we'll get to at some point. And I think people would appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to your earlier question, leather is a lot of uh, what people ask me about a lot lately. Um, and the metal stuff's hard to get. The leather stuff's even harder because um, it is truly handmade. Uh, at least with the metal stuff, I can flip on the machine and walk away for an hour or so. Uh, not with leather. It, it only gets done as long as my fingers are touching it. So, um, I mean, those items are more scarce, I would say, than uh, than the metal items. When I do a leather drop, it's usually 10 to 20 pieces at a time. Um, right now, I'm doing a wallet. because I've had a bunch of people message me, just cash wallet, not a, a tool holder. Uh, I've made like two or three in the past for like friends and one for myself. Um and I've had people asking me for a long time to, to do a release. And I think I'm going to manage 10. And uh, I, you know, I promised it. I started it probably three weeks ago. And I'm probably another week or two away before dropping it. Um, so, I mean, leather is... I enjoy doing leather. I think it's a relaxing... You don't have the humming of machines constantly. So it's, it's nice to be quiet and just work on a project. Um, but it's very time-consuming and... Uh, and because it's so oriented with being handmade, um, you know, the chances of there being a, a flaw or something that I just being a perfectionist, I can't handle happens a lot. Um, so it, it requires a lot of patience. I won't do it when the kids are home because I need to 
like really focused to get that where I want it to be. Uh, but I love doing it, but it's just, uh, it's a tough piece because the amount of effort that goes into it and, you know, you can't really probably quantify it dollar wise. Um, and obviously that would make it not a productive item to make if it doesn't sell because it's too expensive. So I try to keep it low quantity. So I, I stay sane and it's somewhat worth my while. And, and then people appreciate it on the other end because there's not, you know, a hundred of them going out at a time. Sure. The cool thing with the leather is it'll patine over time as well. So it kind of goes hand in hand with your love of the copper and brass for that reason. That'd be cool yeah. to put crayons in though. Be like a little crayon holder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I have three designs in CAD. I, I'm going to bring it to reality. Right. And uh, so it's weird. I, you know, I, everything I design now, I design in CAD, even if it's not going to go on a machine for whatever reason I need to, I feel like I need to visually see it on the screen to kind of understand it uh, rather than just kind of whipping some leather out and hoping it kind of comes together. Right. So uh, yeah, I've had, I have three versions in CAD. Uh, I haven't selected one yet. And once I do select one, it'll probably be another three months before I can actually even put my hands to it. But so. <laughs> well, fun fact, I took a CAD class when I was in high school, when I was like doing wood shop and everything. I then yep. got kicked out of that CAD class because I was arm wrestling because he told us to do something. So we arm wrestled because we didn't have anything to do. Um, the most I ever did in CAD was I built Legos and within CAD, you could stack the Legos. That's yep. the extent of my CAD knowledge. I, I also took I took AutoCAD. Uh, I can't remember because I was I went for uh, construction estimating and that was one of the classes and it was a six to not, six p.m. to nine p.m. class three hours once a week and it was it was a it was cool but it's a lot to take in and I was gonna it's good oh yeah good way to mention it Dom because I was gonna ask you do you have like any like background in CAD no. before that because like most people I feel like would like start with like drawing something up I mean that's just me thinking it but that's kind of wild that you don't have any background in AutoCAD or CAD and you're able to just create. Yeah, no, I, I don't know all of it, to be honest. I, I'm, I'm constantly learning things and uh, people will push me, especially with putters. There'll be certain asks that require a special fixture or something to hold the putter a certain way so I can achieve whatever it is that they want. Um, and, you know, I get challenged with that a lot of times. And then it's, you know, where's YouTube? You know, someone's done it before, I'm sure, in some way. Um, I mean, YouTube's like my, my friend. And if it wasn't for YouTube, I wouldn't have this business to be honest with you. Cause, uh, um, I, I'm not professionally schooled in anything I do. Everything I learned was watching others through YouTube or, uh, meeting some local folks that have done stuff, you know, in a different industry or whatever, mm-hmm. but kind of picking it up and adapting it to golf. Um, so That's yeah, it's more impressive that you're able to do that without even having that uh, training. But yeah, YouTube is like the best. Friend. I mean, it's like changing oil in a car for somebody who doesn't ever do. I mean, why'd you point at me? No, no, I was just I like change my own oil. <laughs> so, you're the only one in here. No, I do but, my just, own oil. but just anything in, in general, like it's like, I don't know how to change this. Like, look it up. You either got Google or YouTube. You know, Google is always like that. Let's let's figure out the answer. But YouTube will actually show you the whole tutorial, you know, and just give you the yeah, the whole thing. So I was shooting. You, you like might appreciate. Cough. You might Go appreciate ahead. this. I was I was shooting a. I call it a sleeper nine nine seven turbo s, uh, for a client, and he goes, "Man, I want to wrap, but I don't know what color." So I'm in Photoshop, and I'm like, "God, I hate Photoshop. I don't know how to change colors or anything. I'm YouTubing, blah blah blah, how to do this." So I ended up changing the color from white to purple to dark blue, and then to powder blue. And I was like, I am so accomplished. And he goes, yeah, I hate all of them. And I was like, thanks. It turned out good, though. It, did, it was sweet. I mean, it was okay. Um, I don't know if he's going to wrap his car any of those colors, but it'd be pretty sweet to have a powder blue 997 Turbo S zooming around. Yeah, but... it gave him a good visual of what you're doing, though. Absolutely. It's a total sleeper, too. It has like 800 horsepower, and you would never know. Oh, uh, yeah, those are the best. Well, they're sweet. Until you start it up, and then you go, okay. Then you okay. really has yeah. 800 horse, yeah. Um, yeah. I know we talked about the leather and the, you know, we've talked about everything a little bit as far as your products, but how, how long does it typically take to make a batch of, let's just say divot tools or the crayon divot tool? Like if you want to do a batch of 20 of those, how, how long would that take you? So the machining of it on the divot tool, the crayon one specifically is not that difficult. Um, that's pretty quick. Um, and I have a good fixture for doing 10 at a time. Um, 
the reason though uh, it, it takes long in terms of producing it is the anodizing. So um, the last, what, I don't know, 12 or 15 crayons I've done have been anodized aluminum. The initial, the, the, the old school, if you will, crayons were carbon steel and I blued it to get like that midnight blue type color crayon. Um, and then I did a copper one and that was brown. So those are the first two I ever did. And then from there, uh, you know, obviously it's crayons, so you need color. And I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of like powder coat or PVD or any of that type of stuff. So then the easy thing was, well, I'm just going to send them out and get them anodized. So I'll mill the aluminum here. I'll get the crayons and I send them out to a partner because I'm not anodizing here in my little garage. Uh, but he gets me the perfect color, whatever hue I want. And then uh, they come back and I do finishing, which is essentially putting the sticker on them and getting them ready for shipping. So it's actually one of the easier uh, tools. The lightning bolt, which you guys are getting, is not easy at all. That's probably the most difficult divot tool I've done just because of this, the small angles um, in the lightning bolt. So I have to use very, very small tooling, uh, being patient. And the other part, that's why there's not huge releases of that. It's just, um, it's just too intricate and time consuming to do that. So, uh, so crayon, I probably milled 10 of them in about 20 minutes. Um, Oh, the uh, the lightning bolt one takes about two hours. <laughs> Jeez, so there's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, with the lightning bolt, there's two sides, and I mean the crayon tool is pretty easy. I'm just using round stock to start, chopping it up on a saw to the right length, and then putting it on the mill, the point side up to get that point right, and then uh, and then I'll flip it and just give a little chamfer on the edge on the back. Um, so that's pretty quick. Um, the lightning bolt needs its own fixture. Um, you know, you're flipping one side, flipping the other on this one here on the stainless steel version, I decided to do face milling on one side, uh, to just to give it some more uniqueness. And then, you know, you introduce the wood piece to it. Um, some laser cutting all the, the wood inlays and, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on with the lightning bolt. <laughs> I'm excited to check it out. Yeah. Appreciate it. That's. It looked awesome from the picture, so I'm sure it's going to be way better. Yeah, and then you you sent me a video of the laser mm-hmm. putting in our logo. That is like the most satisfying thing. I always get like hooked on like TikTok with people like power washing and like pool yeah. cleaning and stuff like that. So that little clip of just the laser working, I was like, oh, I need to like rewatch it over and over and over again. <laughs> so it's so relaxing yeah. about it. Yeah, well, it's funny because I mean, there's different makers out there. There's a bunch of guys out there that do what I do. I'm certainly not the first. I followed a bunch of guys that do some really cool stuff. But one question I get from people all the time is like, "Why are you Why are you lasering and why are you not stamping things?" First off, I'm a technology guy through and through. So if there's a way to do something technology wise, I think that's cool and that's my that's my my deal. I rather do that. I like the interest intricacy of the laser over milling over stamping over anything there's just nothing more intricate than a laser and then the other thing is i have lasers so i'm gonna use them (laughs) (laughs) so you gotta use them right yeah absolutely do you get a lot of like different like people that are trying to start a a divot company or a ball marker company that like will reach out to you and be like hey how do you do this or or do you do that have you ever done that training i know you say you haven't really had any experience starting so yeah, no, I, I mean, it's a great community of guys. Um, uh, there's a bunch of guys I talk to. There's a couple of guys I even play golf with behind the scenes. So uh, Legend Golf, um, he's over in um, central Massachusetts, uh, Joe. So we've played golf a bunch of times. Good guy. We uh, bounce stuff off each other all the time. Uh, Olsen out in California. Um, yep. I had the opportunity to meet with him at the uh, the PGA show a couple of years back. We played golf and um, you know, he'll ask, I think the last time he messaged me, he was asking me about Damascus and how to get the best colors out of it. And I, I message him all the time about fixtures cause he does some amazing putters and, you know, the fixtures he has to do to, to accomplish that are pretty crazy. So, uh, it's cool. It's a, you know, obviously we're all competitive. We all have this similar audiences and, um, there's only so many dollars out there, but, uh, you know, I tell people all the time that ask me about it, like, um, you know, if they find somebody and they get introduced to what we do at some point, they'll probably find me too. So 
I, you know, I, you know, the more we all grow, uh, it works well for all of us, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I'm willing to help anybody if they have questions just to grow the idea of collecting golf tools. And, um, I, I think it's a cool thing and there's enough room for everybody here. So, yeah, I've been following you for got a long time, even before we had like the podcast and everything. And it's so hard for me not to like buy four crayons because I like, get something <laughs> so easy, but then it's just like, what is that? And I'm like, Oh, it's like a little crayon tool. I don't own one. Um, cause I'm waiting on the purple, obviously, like we said, <laughs> yeah, get the purple. Um, um, yeah, no, dude, they're sweet. I think everything you do, it's like, it's so beyond golf, right? You know, the fact that people are collecting it, people are, you know, talking to you about it. it. It's like a piece of art depending on what it is, but it's cool because it's usable art. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so, the best I've gotten from people a couple of times are non-golfers, and they'll reach out to me and be like, dude, this stuff is so cool. It makes me want to play golf, you know, and like, there's nothing awesome. better than that, you know? Um, but you know, you get the EDC community, those guys will, they'll buy some stuff, uh, just because, you know, there's some crossover there. I certainly monitor a lot of what's going on, um, with knife makers and people that make fidget tools and stuff like that, because, uh, you know, I, I'm always looking for creative ideas and ways I can, you know, adapt things to golf, you know? So, um, you know, it's funny. I, I spent a lot of time on Pinterest, uh, just looking at sketches, tattoo art and uh, tattoo art kind of makes its way into some of my stuff a lot of times as well. Um, but I, I look for different things that are off brand. Like I, I'm certainly not that guy that sits at the 19th hole with some whiskey and smoking a cigar. It's just not me. Yeah, you know, I'm certainly not the uh, typical country club type guy. Um, so I try to find things that interest me, that interest people like me, that maybe they won't play golf because they, you know, they have a perception of what golf is or, or, or who plays golf. But uh, growing the game is a is a big big thing for me. Um, I've been thinking of ways to to do that, to introduce it to different communities and just to grow the game. Because I mean, the game has been great for me, not only in business, but um, it's, it's my outlet. Like when I just need to get away from everything, it's the golf course, you know? Uh, so I, I think it's a great game. I think it's a great game for everybody. And, you know, as many people as we can you know, get into the pool would be great. Have you designed any divot tools or anything like that based off of your tattoos? Cause I, so I, I have a couple of tattoos and I'm going to be finishing my one sleeve probably by the end of February of next year. And I see you're tatted up and I, they look awesome, but have you gotten any ideas from either like vice versa from your tattoo or from a divot tool and you got it tatted? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have Krakens on me in different places. I mean, skulls, right. Okay. You know, skulls mm-hmm. are a bit of what I do. Um, I did do a, a small release for a golf shop of, um, uh, a divot tool in the shape of an arm. Um, and on the arm, there's literally it was added up. Um, That's cool. I didn't see that one. Yeah. No, did you put I, it out I, like post it on Instagram at all? No, no, it was, oh, okay. it was okay. I was gonna say. a small batch and it was sure. just them. Um, I probably should do something with it, but, um, yeah, no, I, absolutely. It's a big part of what I do. And, uh, yeah, I, I got hands are next for me, hopefully in January. So, uh, I'm caught to get a hand tattoo <laughs> for sure. I talk tough. Like I want to get one right now, but I said, I do have, it's, it's that typical tattoo thing is like, you have a few and you're always like, yeah, it's not done. I, you know, I'm still working on it. That's kind of my conversation. It's never done. What? get going it's never done <laughs> it is it's, it's addicting it is that's for sure um we've got a couple more questions and then we'll just do some rapid fire questions and we can kind of wrap it up but um one of the questions i had for you was do you have any like collegiate golfers or professional golfers that have reached out or that you tried to sponsor or is that something like maybe a goal of yours down the road do you want to sponsor a young and upcoming podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah because we know two people <laughs> uh, yeah it's weird i mean being you know maybe i shouldn't but i i use the one man shop to my advantage there a lot of times um because it is right but uh yeah, I get approached all the time for sponsorship type stuff. Um, I mean, nobody major on tour or anything like that at this point. Um, but, you know, there's some guys on tour that have my markers and stuff like that. No one with a putter yet. Um, a lot of college athletes, especially with uh, name and likeness out there now, I think I get those DMs like 10 or 15 times a day. Um, and, I, 
you know, it's tough for me. I mean, first off, I don't have that much time to to do what I need to do. Never mind help sponsor someone and what all that goes along with that. Um, so no, I, I haven't done much there. I probably should be doing more there. Um, but uh, it's definitely on my to-do list. Uh, yeah. But you just going to my to-do list is probably too long. <laughs> uh, there was one other question I had. Oh, yeah. Well, I wanted to touch base on your um, the, the VIP access. Can you just kind of describe that and explain how that works for our uh, listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So on Instagram, there's a link there. Uh, my profile link is to my email list. And essentially, I, I give access. It used to work a, mo- a lot better maybe about a year or two ago when I had a little bit less of a following, but I, I would give uh, VIP access to people on the email list. They usually reserved, I don't know, 75% of my release for them. And then 25% would go to uh, the Instagram audience. Um, since then, I, I've just given it all to them because uh, you know those are people that take the time to follow me, take my emails, give me their contact information. Um, a lot of them are messaging me uh, behind the scenes and, uh, I take a lot of pride in trying to get back to everybody that messages me and, uh, and not just a, a thumbs up emoji, but more yeah. than that. Um, so, uh, I mean, those are folks I feel are kind of tied to the brand a bit more. So, um, I would say maybe the last six months or so I've started just letting all the stock go to them. And, uh, now I kind of use Instagram as uh, um, kind of the gateway um, you know, introduce you to my brand, introduce you to my product. And, uh, if you want to partake in limited release items, the get on the email list. Uh, otherwise there's, there's always eBay. Uh, <laughs> exactly. uh, I mean, there's some stock items in the store, so, uh, I don't leave those folks with no opportunity to, to get anything, but, um, my small quantity limited release type items, um, they're only uh, through the email list at this point. Uh, and again, that's the profile link on Instagram. Have you seen people sell your stuff on eBay? Like, have you looked up? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, on Facebook, there's a, a, a buy, sell trade group. Um, it was started by probably one of my best customers, Trent Donahue. Uh, so Trent started that group on Facebook. Um, you have to, uh, you know, ask to join. I think right now there's, uh, maybe 2,600 members, if I uh, could be off there, something like that. But they do a lot of trading of items and in search of releases that they missed out on and, you know, all that type of stuff. Uh, certainly there's eBay too. Um, but I, I kind of monitor a little bit more what's going on in the Facebook group. Uh, Trent was nice enough to make me an admin on there as well. Um, I, I don't post on there too often, but um, you know, he does most of the work there and, you know, I appreciate everything he does there. Uh, cause you know, he's doing it just out of his love of the brand and, uh, kind of a friendship we've developed. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's where I, I mean, I have people ask me all the time, where do I get some of your like original stuff? Do you have any? And I wish I did. I wish I would have kept a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, at the time though, I was just, uh, you know, shoestring business selling everything I can, you know? Right. <laughs> What's your favorite part of the process and what is like one of your, what's the least favorite part of your process? I'll start with least because I had to do it today and that's cleaning machines. I hate it. Absolutely hate okay. cleaning. I would have never uh, even thought of that to be honest. Well, clean up is oh. always the worst. I know, but it just, I, some, I guess I'm not doing yeah. it. So. Well, I try to dedicate Friday for deep clean because there's the light clean I do at the end of the day where I just, you know, spray up, spray down the mills, just make sure that, uh, you know, all the chips are off and all that. Um, but, you know, I try to dedicate Fridays to really getting in those machines and scrubbing it down and a light oil mist and all that stuff. And it doesn't happen as much as it probably needs to. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely the worst. Um, second worst would be long releases. I get bored. So I'll, I'll be midway through it and I'll have another idea. And I so want to transition to the new idea and just leave the rest where, where it is. But uh, that's usually uh, an issue for me. Uh, what I like is the design process, probably the most like getting into the CAD, uh, you know, kind of pulling a design together, stumbling across some roadblocks and to the point where you're like, you know, this idea is not going to work. It's just scrap it all. And then, you know, for me, maybe going back to a bad thing is I'll wake up at three in the morning and 
I'll have that idea and I'll figure it out. And it's like, yeah, I'm not going back to sleep now. <laughs> now you're up. You're going to head to the shop and you're going to take yeah, care of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So let's get down to a couple golf questions and then we'll, we'll uh, do some rapid fire questions. How, how often do you get out and play golf? Um, right now it's usually once, twice a week. I mean, winter's coming, so it won't be as much now, but in the summertime, uh, a good week would be two rounds. I, I usually dedicate Sunday morning. Um, and I usually try to sneak out Friday afternoon. Uh, those are usually my two time slots, but, uh, yeah, usually, hopefully two times a week would be good for me. And so where is your golf game right now? As far as like handicap or how, how you hitting them? Um, I'm probably hovering around nine right now. Okay. Um, Short game could use some work. Uh, I got you. Don't worry. Uh, putting's good, uh, but uh, chipping is definitely my uh, frustrating part of my game. Tom, do you have any questions before we spit off some uh, rapid fire questions you can think of? No, we asked mine. We did. Okay, I did. Yeah, right, I was cool. brainstorming sure. all day. Just wanted to make. Yeah, try not to buy anything off the website. <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Like I said, we we appreciate your time. Like I said, it's been it's been a pleasure to have you on here because it's you're 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 like a Swiss Army knife, man. You, you can do it all. You said you do the cat. You can a Swiss Army knife marker would be sick too. There you go. Just I'm saying. just plugging it. <laughs> my, so my dad's a big Swiss Army knife guy, and I know he's gonna watch this Friday and kind of look at me. And go, no, I'm not. Yes, he is. He yeah. he's at the point where he like collects them. So like a Swiss Army knife ball mark would be pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe put it like on his on remember? like his desk or whatever. Yeah, it's on the design board. See, <laughs> oh, there we go. It's on the long list. Okay, um, so some rapid fire questions. I did switch it up a little bit. We've kind of been, I've been repetitive with the last few uh, guests. So the first question is is oh that's new. Yeah, I got a, got a couple new questions. Um, favorite ball marker to use out on the course. Uh, my favorite one to use, I would say it's the rotor and caliper right now. I've been using that since they came out, uh, and I haven't switched it up for anything more recent. Um, I would go with that, yeah. And you've already answered the putter, but I'm going to ask again, what's your favorite putter right now? Uh, Born 4.0. Uh, I always go stainless steel because, as I mentioned, I'm focusing on golf. I'm not focused on maintaining my club, make sure it doesn't get water on it and rust and all that type of stuff so stainless steel born for me all day long okay hold on i have a question see this is why they're not rapid fire um so obviously like your putters are like sweet right like they're pretty cool not to toot your own horn um like what's like the price range like what do they start at and then like what's the most expensive somebody's done because we were kind of uh, looking earlier yeah so for a custom putter right now uh 1099 um starting point and then it goes up from there depending on materials and intricacies and neck styles and all that uh the most expensive putter to date has been thirty two hundred dollars uh mm -hmm. damascus and mokum combined uh with a crazy neck and a bunch of inlays i imagine though when you're doing a custom like that most people really aren't they want what they want so that's it's not yeah that's probably like their one putter forever yeah, I, I I struggle with that sometimes. Like sometimes I just want to do my own thing. Uh, custom school. Um, uh, sometimes you get folks that uh, want to have a lot of hand in on the design process, which is fine, um, as long as it's like one time through and not twelve times through. <laughs> that <laughs> but, would be kind uh, of annoying after a while. Yeah, I could I could see. But uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, part of me sometimes, I mean, again, bandwidth issues at some point, I'm probably not going to offer custom anymore. Just because I just won't be able to do it. Um, so if anyone's interested in custom putter, uh, you never know when they won't be available anymore. But uh, yeah, I definitely yeah. hit you up on that because I got a couple <laughs> ideas. So I definitely got that down the road for sure. Um, all right. Sorry. Yeah, we say rapid fire questions. They're never rapid fire. They're always, we always get, you know. Um, what is your uh, go-to snack on the course? Um, probably peanut butter crackers. Um, like the yellow one or the orange ones? Oh, no, no. Like with the cheese now. No, no. Like they have some with peanut butter, though. No yeah. peanut butter for sure. But you know how sometimes they have them with like the orange crackers, like a cheese cracker with yeah, peanut I know butter? What you're talking yeah, about. they have some with peanut butter, though, yeah. too. Yeah, regular for a second, I thought you said crackers and peanut butter. Like, I wasn't even thinking of like, crackers with peanut butter i was thinking oh. legit like you you bring crackers yeah, in yeah. A, like a jar of peanut butter. No, i pictured like little sandwiches 
Yeah, or, or that too. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. that's a good. That's a good answer. I like that. Um, early morning tea time or twilight golf? Um, I prefer twilight. I never get. Tw- I have three kids, so it doesn't happen. Uh, so usually gotcha. it's early morning, uh, which is really not that good right now with frost delays. It makes it even worse. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I prefer twilight. I just never get to do twilight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you, you, that's, that's Dom's too. We've, we talked about this. I didn't keep that one on there. Yeah. Cause me and Dom always have that debate. Um, favorite course that you've played. Oh, um, Hmm. Uh, I mean, probably the most famous one that people might know that I've played is, um, uh, the Deutsche Bank, the old Deutsche Bank, TPC Boston. Uh, I've had the opportunity to play there a couple of times. Um, I like playing my home course right now, which is New Bedford Country Club. It's a private course in the next city over New Bedford. It's a city course. Uh, it's probably the most challenging course in the area. That's what I like about it. I joined there specifically to improve my golf game, knowing that the course would kill me every time I play it. Uh, but it helps me on the munis when I go play with my buddies, though. So, sure. uh, yeah. So speaking of that, are you uh, more of a link style golf course guy or a like a traditional style trees and all that? I like both. In my backyard, I live on uh, a course uh, called the Cushionet Valley, uh, and half the course is uh, a wooded cor- wood line course, and the other half is links open field. Uh, so it's kind of cool. You get both worlds in the same round, uh, and it's always in great shape, great course. Um, uh, I probably would like wooded more traditional as if I had to pick one. It's just more more challenging in the sense that you got to keep the ball straight and um, I, a lot of times I just think it, it's uh, a little bit more character than a, a field, if you will. <laughs> That's why I feel, I feel like links courses just like, don't have that like aesthetic appeal to them. You're like, Oh boy, it's ground. And then there's a hole. It's like, at least with wood, you're like, Oh man, there's like a big tree in the middle of a fairway that shouldn't be there, but I'm going to hit it every time. Or it's like a big rock somewhere or whatever. I, I just don't like links courses. They're just kind of boring to me. I prefer yeah. the style, but I, I think it's with like, I mean, you got the wind and all like that. The greens are always so fast too. So, I mean, it is yeah. difficult, but I, I do, I get what you're saying. Yeah. You have to kind of keep it in play when you got a bunch of trees, you know, right off side of the, right outside of the fairway for sure. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite major championship? Um, I like the, I like the open. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah. I, I like it that it's, you know, a different location all the time. And, uh, I mean, obviously everyone would probably say the masters and, uh, I look forward to the masters week every year and usually some of my best releases come out of that. But, uh, what I like about the open is usually, uh, you know, the challenge of it, um, you know, the higher scores and I, and just being at different locations all the time, I find the different locations interesting. Um, so I, I would probably say that. Um, if you're not playing golf or making, uh, Bar markers or art yeah what what do you what do you spend your time with uh on besides your family of course uh probably car stuff like your stuff my wife gets mad like i, I probably spend too much time about the car <laughs> <laughs> I, like Dude. my fourth kid Bro. exactly i have three kids well i have four kids i have three three well i have uh eight ten twelve and a, a 1969 blah 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 Oh, you Do you go. have a pretty cool muscle car or anything like that? Uh, I'm kind of more Euro, if you oh, will. So boy. I, yeah. I have a six series. It's all tuned up. Ooh, uh, sweet. That's a BMW. Yeah. Yeah. So that's six like, like that's my <laughs> very cool. Those are sweet. Um, okay. I have pretty much one last question before we ask the last food question that we always ask, but do you have any advice that you might give, uh, someone who is an entrepreneur starting a business? Yeah, uh, probably too much, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, uh, biggest thing is just to find the thing that you're passionate about uh, in life uh, and then figure out a way to make money at it. Uh, that's the advice I give my kids all the time. Uh, I know growing up, the advice I was given is go to college, go to college, go to college, which is not bad advice, but um I, I alter that a little bit. Just find what you're passionate about and make money at it. And it doesn't have to be huge sums of money either. It's just, you know, make enough and learn to live within whatever that range is 
And uh, so you can get up every Monday morning and feel eager to get up every Monday morning and do something you love rather than, you know, Sunday night. And I don't want to get up tomorrow morning because I got to go somewhere I don't want to go and, and all that kind of stuff. So that, that would be my biggest advice. Find something you're passionate about and then figure out a way to monetize it. I love that. That's awesome advice. I think it's really simple, but at the same time, I feel like so many people, we we all kind of, a lot of people take that uh, and, and don't apply it sometimes, you know? Cause I, I know that where you wake up like Sunday night, you're like, I gotta go back to work tomorrow. So I, I totally hear you on that. Yeah, Tom, do you want to ask the food question? So we can answer this one of two ways. We can either do it the long way, which is my favorite way, or we can do it the short way, which seems to be the most common way. So, uh, have, if you, <laughs> so if you could, like, if you're dying tomorrow, right? what would the last day of food look like for you? Like we've had some people just give us one meal. We've had some people like break it down, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What are you eating on your last day? Wow. Uh, definitely Italian for sure. Uh, a bunch of Italian food, probably a bunch of junk food. Throw some Twinkies in there. I'll take some Twinkies, probably the whole box. Uh, <laughs> ice cream. I, I would, you know, it'd be... Uh, yeah, I'd be a wreck. <laughs> like the rocks <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big food guy. I, I can eat food like, you know, I, I love it. Uh, I try to resist it. But yeah, I mean, yeah, Italian's my big thing. Like Italian restaurants you know, all day long. Me and my wife, that's our thing. Is there one place you want to give us give a little shout out to that's in your area that you really would uh, would suggest if someone's in that area? Um, so there was a, there's a restaurant that used to be called Pasta House. It's in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. They just did a, a name change, and redesigned the restaurant, same owner, everything's still the same. It's just, they modernized it, I guess, a little bit. It's called uh, Boca, B-O-C-C-A, uh, Fairhaven, Massachusetts, pasta food. Uh, make sure you have reservations because it's impossible to, to get in. Uh, but I, that would be my recommendation for something uh, local to me. Very cool. Well, Mark, man, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks again for taking the time and uh, kind of picking your brain and learning all about the uh, process. And uh, we look forward to some of the other limited releases down the road and I'd like to have you back on the podcast, maybe in the next, next year, we'll have you down and down the road. Yeah, no, I appreciate you guys reaching out and uh, you know, considering uh, having me as a guest uh, much appreciated. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the tools. Uh, uh, a lot of work went into those, but uh, I can't wait to hear your feedback when they uh, when they get in your hands. I'm excited, even though we probably won't use them right away because it's going to snow here in like a week. Welcome to Minnesota. We'll just sit on a nice little display for now though, yeah. until the golf season comes there you around. Go. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again. Yeah, we'll definitely be posting on there. Um, before we hop off, though, I did want to mention, I'll we'll probably put in the intro, but we are going to be giving away one green crayon divot tool. Uh, I'm going to order it. And then all I got to do is follow Cracking Golf, Safe Park Golf Podcast, and then give us a positive review on our podcast page. So we'll have that on there. So thanks again, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, man. Take care. Take care.